Uh, right, so as Stuart already mentioned, my name is Bodil. This is my Twitter handle, you know what to do. And my talk was supposed to be called Closure Screen All the Way Down, but um, somebody earlier complained about overuse of, of memes at this conference, so I decided to instead call it Closure Script All the Things. <laughs> Right, and the concept here is I'm going to basically be writing um, an application in ClojureScript, a web application with a server and a client side with in ClojureScript. And this is all going to happen live on stage. And the rules of live coding is that you are going to help me because I'm probably going to run into typos and stupid mistakes and I'm assuming the people in this room uh, are the most qualified people in the world to help me out. So if I fail, that is your failure, right? <laughs> okay, let's get started. I'm going to give you a quick overview. Um, I have some files prepared already. I'm not going to write everything. Like the CSS, you don't want, you don't want to watch me do that. Uh, here's the project file. Yeah, Dan Freeman asked me if, if it's called computer science all the way down, because that's what it says on the on the program, but it's not. And I am basically using um, a version of Hiccup. Um, there are lots of, of Hiccup ports uh, um, to ClojureScript, but, but all of them produce uh, DOM trees. And I need it on the server side where, where there's no DOM. So I was lucky to find one port of Hiccup to ClojureScript which actually produces strings, and that's what I'm going to be using. It's called Hiccups. Because, you know, CLJ, CLJ, CLJS, hiccup, hiccups, makes sense. And, of course, um, I noticed Conrad Bosky's talk uh, two days ago and decided to rewrite the code to use his web framework, or, or at least a little bit of it. Uh, further on, this is Node. This is running on Node.js. So I, I've used some Node um, technologies um, to power the back end. Um, Express, the um, traditional Node web framework. Uh, a, a MongoDB driver. I'm going to be using Mongo for the database. And Socket IO to do communication between client and server. Excuse me. So, um, let us go on to the server code. I'm just going to enlarge here. So, um, First of all, um, ClojureScript uh, data types are not compatible with JavaScript data types. And while there is a JS to CLJ function in, in the ClojureScript core library, there's a conspicuous absence on the opposite. So I am, as most people have, I had to re-implement this. Um, so I'm including hiccups, and I've written a very uh, lightweight Mongo wrapper for ClojureScript. So let's just get started. Let's, let's just get a server going, first of all. We start by requiring some, J, some node stuff, like the HTTP uh, package and express. And and so can I Right. Now, nodes in ClojureScript requires this strange invocation to define the entry point. So we have a function main, which takes args, which we just ignore. And let's just connect to the database right away. Uh, yeah, so the application I'm, I'm going to be writing is a, <coughs> a to-do list. I didn't know Rich was going to be doing the same thing. But. And um, basically, I'm going to make a checklist of uh, programming langu language theory concepts that I want to learn. So we're connecting to the database PLT, and it takes a callback. We're already in callback hell, because this is uh, basically JavaScript interop. Um, so, this should connect to the database and then call a function called server. Bring the database. Right. 
So, um, I am going to use what I like to call a mock state monad. Just an atom to, to maintain my connection to the database. So let's put um, the collection. So this, um, this basically um, stores a reference to a table in the Mongo database called concepts. And then let's create the actual web server. We do that by calling express. And we are going to wrap the express app in an HTTP server. And let's see where we are. Yeah. A threading macro. We need to configure this app to uh, display our static files. And because static is a um, reserved keyword in JavaScript, and the Clojure compiler refuses to let us um, have um, Clojure script uh, symbols called static, we're going to do some trickery. Sorry. We're going to fetch the static property using a string out of Express, and then call it uh, with our static file folder to define where we keep our files. And then we just define um, our main page. And now the function get main takes a request and a response. Should just basically uh, write something uh, back on the response. So standard hello world, first of all. This should almost be running now. We need to uh, tell it to start listening. So, listen. Server, port 1337, that sounds about right. <laughs> so, closure script. Oh, great. What am I doing wrong? What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with that? Oh, sorry, 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 it's, it's a function call. <laughs> See, I told you to watch out for this. <laughs> and ClojureScript uh, has to compile, of course, and this brings me back to the Halcyon days on C++, I must say. There we go. <laughs> so uh, let's just, um, I'm going to run, because um, um, Catnip, my editor, uh, hasn't properly integrated, we're actually running Node, um, applications. So I'm just going to use a shell script for that. That's just going to watch my uh, main.js file that the closure script compiles to. And so we shall be able to actually see something happening. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Hello world. That flows. <laughs> this is awesome. Right. Um, but let's get fancy. Page template. Let's just make a function that actually renders some HTML. And call that. So first of all, let's just check that that's working. By wrapping the Hello Sailor into a header tag. Compiling, compiling. The server kernel is, is uh, especially slow compiling because um, I need to concatenate it, so I'm using uh, simple optimizations. Wow, what happened there? Oh yeah, of course. We need to, of course, call hiccup HTML and then just let's get that. <laughs> Recompile, yeah. I'm just gonna carry on while we <laughs> wait for that. So, here we go. That's HTML. But um, let's uh, get WebFooey involved. I made some WebFooey boilerplate. I'm just going to comment our socket IO until I need it. 
and recompile that and then get over to um, the client side. Now, um, what we should be getting here soon is, um, yeah, we see it's, it's changed color, so the CSS must be working. And it should be loading and running our closure script. So just quick check to see if that works. This one should compile a little faster, yeah. And it works. Right. So let's get started on this side. Let's just get WebFui up and running. We define a DOM, which is an atom, which starts out being nil. We define some state, which is another atom, which is just going to be an empty list. I'm going to put my, my documents in here as we go. My, my to-do list entries. And we call defdom to make web fully aware of what we want the DOM to be. And we make a function to update the DOM and a function to render. Like that. Just wrapping everything in a div because it didn't seem to work otherwise. And then, right. Now, um, I'm only using a very small part of WebFui, so uh, there's, I have to uh, automate the process myself to get it started. So I didn't mention uh, the um, use statements on top here. I'm re reusing CLJJS because you need that everywhere. I've written a very, very lightweight DOM library, which, for one thing, has a DOM ready function, which um, takes a callback, which is called when the DOM has loaded. And that's what we So, when we have a ready DOM, we should just call update DOM. This should hopefully give us a header render by web, by web Yay! We're guessing there. Just uh, something isn't quite right. Let's just add something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, that looks better. <laughs> OK. So uh, now let us just add some state for now. Uh, go to. And we are going to have a property called done, which is a Boolean. Let's just try and render that. Uh, let's make a function which takes a document of the kind that we have on top and returns a list item. Give it a class. Um, if it's done, then it should be done, otherwise it should be open. Let's see, wait. There, and a span, class check, with a data ID of item ID. This is added by MongoDB later. We're just going to use it to refer back to this. And the content, if done, done. <laughs> then we have a nice, oh, sorry, a nice little uh, UTF uh, glyph for the checkbox. And here's the glyph for the box without the check. And finally, a span which contains the actual text, like so. Of course, nothing happens, because I do have to actually see, uh, have an IUL. And then, quite simply, we just um, remember my state atom. We, where, where did we go? There we are. We just basically map the contents of the state atom over the concept item function. And that should give us a pre-populated list with a go-to. Yay! Right. 
So nothing fancy so far, but let's, um, let's get the database involved and let's hook up Socket.io and see if we can get something interesting going. First of all, I'm just going to add an input field. Uh, type text. Uh, and then we need to connect the socket. Dev socket. This doesn't need to be an atom. This is just JavaScript. Connect JS slash IO back to the server on localhost. And yeah, that should be good so far. Back to the server site. You notice it went blank now. That's because it's trying to use socket IO at the top of the script and it's not loading. So here we go. But it's still not going to work because we need to actually initialize socket IO. So just go full screen for a bit. Uh, let's just initialize that. We turn socket IO to install on our HTTP server object. And there I get to use my dot minus notation. <laughs> huh? No, that's, that is correct, in fact, yeah. Because uh, we are going to fetch um, io.socket. Um, this would, in JavaScript, it will, it will read io.sockets.on. So this is right. Uh, so we're calling the on method on the connection event. So every time um, a web socket connects to the server now, this function is going to be called with a socket object. And what we want to do is we are going to send the contents of, of the database to a socket when it connects. So let's make a send docs function that does that. <coughs> Sorry about that. I seem to be coming down with, with uh, Phil Hag Hagelberg's disease. <laughs> <coughs> so there may be some coughing. Uh, well, while we uh, send docs, it takes a socket. And we're going to call Mongo. Mongo uh, find all. Uh, oh, I hate that. The, the print screen key is right next to my, my alt key on the keyboard. It's so stupid. So it takes the collection we want to, to run a query on. It takes a query object. And it's just going to be an empty map because we want everything. And then it takes a callback, which should just be, it takes uh, the result. And we just call emit on the socket, which, which sends an event to the, to the client. It's going to be called docs. And we need to convert that object to JavaScript before we try sending it. And that should be it. That should send this event to the client with all the data we need to render. So back to the client, and let's do that. Do that. So we have a socket object already here. So we should be able to just add a listener. Docs. And a callback on new docs. And we are going to create a function for that. Docs. Convert them back. Yeah, for, for JavaScript interrupt. Not a bother at all. And then put the new state in our state atom. And tell WebFoo to re render itself. And that should actually be it. This should, unless I'm very much mistaken, it should now render the contents of the database. Yeah, notice our go to just vanishes. Let's run that again. Let's pay attention to the go to that's there for a split second. So um, what happens is that it first renders the contents on the state atom at initialization time. And then it gets an event from the server, which contains nothing. So this is working just fine. Let's just take that out. So um, 
We want to start populating the database. So let's get back to that input field. Now, another uh, function I have in my um, little DOM library is a function called watch, which listens to DOM events. And it takes the, the event name, it takes a CSS selector. Um, I've had to hack this a bit, because um, at, um, at um, uh, initialization time, uh, the DOM is empty, WebFoo has yet to render it, and it runs it asynchronously, apparently. So I can't just attach events to, to um, DOM elements that already exists. So I'm attaching them to the document, and I'm using a CSS selector to filter, a bit like jQuery does. Um, yeah, let's get back to what we're doing. So, um, no, sorry, on new, on submit is a good name for it. So I want a function called on submit to be uh, called when the form is submitted, it takes an event, and since this is a form submit, we want to make sure that it doesn't just reload the page. So this is just standard DOM. And then, we need to find the input element. Q is another uh, DOM function which just as you probably can guess, um, finds a DOM element using a selector. Now, the value of that input field should be stored. The Nash is intentional once again. Right, and I want this to work um, in such a way that when I enter something in the input field and press return, there's something WebFoo doesn't support, by the way. I hope that's coming which is the reason, by the way, why I'm not using all web for me. Um, so when I press return, I want, um, I want the input field to be cleared and the previous contents to be sent to the server. So, so we set the value to empty string and we emit an, an event like that with a previous value. So the server doesn't implement this yet, but I'm just gonna test that it looks right. Yeah, press enter and it vanishes, and presumably the event is triggered, but nothing on the server responds to it yet. Let's do that. Uh, so whenever a, a WebSocket is instantiated on the server, we want to listen to events as well. It works the same way as on the client, we have a new event. Wasn't that why I call it? Yeah. yeah, that is quite correct. So, on new doc socket, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I need to include the socket object in the call, and it's also going to be called with the data that is being sent from the event. So, uh, what this does is call a function on new doc, which takes a socket and some data. This is just gonna be the string that we sent, the value string from the client. Um, let's just put that right into the database. It takes a collection once again, and it takes a document. So let's construct that document name, as you recall. That should be the data. And done should default to false. And it takes a callback, which is just gonna be to call send docs on the socket, which basically uh, performs a, um, a save operation on the database and does a query on, on the new contents of the database and sends that back. So the client will automatically update itself once uh, the change is done. Save that. At this point, once that decides to compile, there we go, we should be able to start adding things to our uh, checklist. So monads, everybody needs to learn monads, right? <laughs> I actually learned that yesterday. A monad is like a strained metaphor. 
<coughs> and co-monads. You know, like jQuery, right? Yeah, because uh, there's a huge debate, uh, jQuery. Um, people are wonder, wondering if jQuery counts as a monad. No, it does not. But there's a theory that, that it might be a co-monad. <laughs> that is not an excuse to start using jQuery, though. OK, and moving on. Psygo histomorphic prepromorphisms. Wow. That didn't add. Why didn't that add? <laughs> Is that an error message? I wonder. I don't see why that should be a problem. <laughs> Let's try again. Just going to copy that just in case. <laughs> oh, right. OK, well, it's an interesting sh subject. It should be done twice, right? <laughs> so um, that is a real thing in Haskell. That is actually a Haskell comedy. Don't worry if you don't get it. You get it later when you, when you evaluate it. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> Haskell humor. Uh, and uh, one final thing. Uh, we're going to be really ambitious here and uh, go beyond the final frontier. Whatever Oleg was talking about in a strange loop, I want to understand that. <laughs> right. So, we now populated our database. Now I want to be able to click um, the checkbox to indicate that I learned, because I do, I do know monads, at least slightly. So, um, let's add a click handler on span.check, because the checkbox is in a span with a class of check, so every checkbox now should have this handler on check. Guess an event, and we want to get the ID of, wait a minute, I have a function called target, which gets the target element of an event, and a function called data, which takes, uh, these parentheses are not balanced, right? There we go. And yeah, the data function takes an element and a data uh, attribute name and returns the content of that. Remember earlier, I put a data ID uh, attribute on the check span. So I'm going to know uh, by looking at this what kind of element, what kind of list item I clicked. Right. And that should be fairly simple. Since we already know the ID, we just emit an event on the socket. Check and the ID back to the server. We need to listen for that event. Check. Hey, the timer went blank. Um, so on check, let's just call that on check. And that will take the socket and the ID that we sent over. So let's call Mongo again. Once again with a collection, and this just takes an ID as a second argument to indicate we want to update uh, a single document. And it takes a function, a kind of mutator function, which gets the, the doc in question and should just return the modified document. So, asos doc done and the inverse of docs done property. So that should just, just flip it between true and false. Uh, and it also takes a callback, which is once again send a socket. That should, in fact, be it. Wow! Unbalanced parentheses. That's quite correct. 
Uh, this one's right, and there we should be good. So these parentheses. We'd be so much readable, wouldn't it, if, if they, were, they were corner braces? <laughs> so Java people keep telling me, at least. <laughs> right, let's see if that works. Let's try and check out the monads. Oh, wow, that was painless. Cool. And it toggles. Excellent. Let's just leave them unchecked. I also know jQuery, so good. <laughs> uh, one more thing. I mean, um, for one thing, I want to remove the duplicate here. So let's create a delete function in our last couple of minutes. That should be fairly straightforward. I'm just going to copy this ban, give it a class delete, keep the data ID for clicking, and this doesn't need a stateful. Uh, there we go. I'm just going to make that an X. And? Shit, what did I do? Like that. <laughs> Search so span delete on delete. And this is a very straightforward one. I just copy this on delete. Sends a delete and does exactly the same thing. It fetches the data ID and, and emits an event with the ID. So, set aside. Listen. And we need a function that goes to the database. Sockers ID. And this one is called delete ID, would you imagine? Uh, takes the same parameters. And this doesn't need a mutator function, obviously, so just a callback. That should, in fact, be it. Huh? Of course I knew. Thank you. Still compiles, though. Ambrose, are you going to fix this? <laughs> OK. Reload. Now let's try and get rid of one of the prepromorphisms. It is, by the way, um, quite simply, if you're wondering what, what that means, it's just a prepromorphism that's also, that's both zygomorphic and histomorphic at the same time. <laughs> I don't see the problem there. Right, so that deletes, and I mean, uh, there's ambition, and then there's just hubris, so let's admit we're never going to understand Oleg and get rid of that. <laughs> So that was, in fact, it. That's, um, that's a pure closure script application. Um, backstory, by the way. Um, Catnip, the editor that I've been using, um, is a, a kind of closure editor uh, with a server-side uh, closure component and a client-side that runs in the browser. And as strangely, David Nolan asked me, um, that's written in closure script, right? And I had to, I mean, if I, if I'd like kicking a puppy, I had to admit it's actually written in coffee script. <laughs> so, <laughs> to atone, uh, I decided that, I mean, this, this talk has been done before as uh, a service like closure thing. So I decided to atone by doing everything, everything in closure script for, for a change. So uh, that's closure script running on nodes on the server. Communication using socket IO. I would have used crate, except it's not been ported to closure script yet. Um, and let's see, yeah, the MongoDB driver, that's also node. So there's a lot of interrupt, as you noticed. And if I have, I have two wishes. I'm going to play the, the Chris Granger game here. And I have two wishes for, for closure script. For one thing, Why you know in core? <laughs> CLJ to JS, yeah, seriously. <laughs> and even better, of course, would be if, if there was transparent interop, um, so that when, when you call out to JavaScript, um, maps and arrays and things like that might perhaps be just converted for you. That would have been nice. 
Also, can, can the closest code compiler please run faster? <laughs> Thanks. Right, that's it for me. Um, looks like we have plenty of time for questions, if there should be any. There usually aren't. But <laughs> that's how we go. That's one. In manipulating the DOM. That is the problem, because um, you notice, I'm, I'm going to show you my DOM library. Every closure script project usually has something like this. It might just include JQ or Domina or one of the many. What's, what's the online version of, for closure script called? And focus, right. So, so people, people have been writing DOM libraries for closure script, but they all, of course, involve uh, calling out to the DOM or calling the DOM through Google Closure, which is usually safer. Um, and the DOM is going to be mutable anyway. But the guy who's sitting in front of you uh, has done a nice job working around that for you know, make, making, making this nicer for Closure Scrim um, with, with Web3. But you're right, it doesn't handle the entries properly. No, I just assume that you haven't imp implemented the features you needed for your talk. <laughs> so I'm assuming it's, it's going to come. And I was too stressed out the day before yesterday to implement it myself, sorry. <laughs> right, any more? <laughs> <laughs>